AC, you might be on mute. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I present myself, Secretary of uh, IATA Schedules Information Standards Committee and the Minimum Connecting Time Working Group. And joining me uh, on this webinar from IATA is uh, the project team, also Mr. Bernard Paul and Teresa Mentoni, as well as the members from our Minimum Connecting Time Working Group, Ms. Uh, Ruth uh, Newman, from American Airlines, Thomas Gross from Swiss International Airlines, and Bonnie Chu from Flight Global, also representing the data aggregator. A new minimum connecting time standard has been defined and adopted by the industry um, for airline processes and managing MCT and facilitating the presentation, application, and transmission of MCTs between the airlines, data aggregators, GDSs, and IT providers. As this new standard will impact stakeholders globally, we hope this webinar will help you get a better understanding of the new standard on your scheduling activity and processes. Of course, um, please feel free to ask questions uh, during each slide. We will uh, take uh, your questions and uh, try to uh, answer them as well as we go along throughout the uh, presentation. So I will um, give the floor to Ruth from American Airlines who will start uh, the uh, presentation now. Hello everybody. I was going to say good morning but for most of you it's afternoon so um, we'll just say happy Thursday. Um, many of us on the working group, I guess we've been doing this almost, well, I guess it'll be three years coming up pretty soon, and we've been working very hard to come up with a standard that will help not just the airlines, but also the aggregators and the processing systems um, determine minimum connecting times much easier. Um, what we've done is we've created a standard hierarchy so that airlines um, products will be sold the same across all platforms. So if you look up an itinerary in Sabre, you should also get the same itinerary in Navitair or uh, Google or any of the other things. So, um, that's what we're going to talk about today and we'll show you what the key differences are and um, how we're going to get to October of 2019. Thank you, Ruth. I will just uh, start the presentation now. I'm just having some difficulties at the moment. So I appreciate uh, your patience. Just a few you seconds. You might be showing the wrong slides. My my slide cannot seem to be moving forward. I have. Um... I could just give me a second. Okay. I'll do it from my end. Give me a sec. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's working now. Okay, it seems to be working now. Can we try again, please? Yes. Is perfect. It working? Thank you. Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Hi. Hey, okay, we're back. <laughs> We're back in business. Um, Thank you. I, won't, I won't read these word for word. You guys can look at them or maybe you already have. Um, what is really driving and what drove the start of this initiative was because um, we have not as an industry had a standard for MCTs. Um, code shares have um, expanded exponentially 
and um, that brings in complexities to minimum connect times. Flight ranges, of course, all of the airlines have flight ranges. Some are used for operating, some are used for marketing, code share. So there's more complexity there. And then stations that have multiple terminals, that adds an additional layer of complexity. And because there's not a standard processing, the airlines are getting different results across various GDSs. So for example, I'll just give American as an example. Um, we may have one itinerary build on our website, aa.com, um, which is um, hosted by Google. And then um, our GDS platform is Sabre for our reservation system. So sometimes across those two platforms, we don't always have identical itineraries. So that has become a challenge. So the working group was put together to try and standardize a lot of this. And we believe we've made a lot of progress. And so that's what we're going to go through here today to show you what those key differences are. This this just explains some of what I've talked about as well. Izzy, can we go to um, the next slide, please? So this is some of the key um, items and how these problems affect our industry. Um, we have passengers and bags misconnecting, which as airlines, we all know that that um, costs us money. So we want to try and do whatever we can to eliminate some of that risk. Um, as I said earlier, with all of the complexities of minimum connect times with code shares and multiple terminals, um, the data has just really begun to get very complex. Um, there's also the risk of errors and typos, um, even just um, a transformation or a typo of flight numbers, you know, reversing a flight number that could cause um, that that has consequences if the wrong flight number is in the MCT. Um, what else? Uh, minimum connect times have also some airlines use them for marketing connect times. And so those also come with certain risks and there's no standard. So however the airlines choose to use these, we've helped to make that much smoother for everyone. Any questions so far? So far so good. Okay, thank you. This is a summary of where we've come. And you can see at the bottom, these MCT exceptions, I think we took these numbers back in 2016, I believe. And these are all stations that have multiple terminals. So you can see in Paris, for example, because of all the multiple terminals and all the airlines that fly there, at that time, there were 11,400 MCT exceptions in Paris. So you can see how we've gotten to this data explosion because of code share MCTs. And also the very last point on here is there's no easy way to suppress connections globally. So if as an airline, if I don't have an agreement with another carrier, I currently have to go into every single station where I don't want to build connections and I have to file MCTs in all of those stations. One of the things we did as the working group was we've made that process a little bit easier. And we'll go through that here in a little bit. This is just more background information on how the why the working group was put together and what our goals were. So this is kind of where we are and where we're getting to. Um, 
last year in October, the passenger service conference um, endorsed the working group's proposal and agreed on our timeline. So then in um, March of this year, hopefully you are all familiar with this, uh, the new chapter eight was published in the SIM manual. Hopefully everyone has received that copy and has been able to go through it at least um, at a very high level. Um, IATA is working on the industry-wide awareness campaign, of which that's why we're all here today. And end-to-end -to -end testing will begin in first quarter of 2019. In the meantime, there are some airlines, GDSs, and the data aggregators working on some prototype testing. And we can talk about that too as well here in a little bit. Now, how will we all benefit? I know this says airlines because obviously airlines are the key benefactor of this. However, it is going to help the um, GDSs and the data aggregators as well. But for the airlines, uh, a huge benefit to this is that we are going to get a consistent product across all booking channels. Um, this uh, will also reduce the volume of MCTs that we have to manage. It's also going to improve um, connection building with our code share partners and our interline partners as well. Um, the same MCT updates will go to both Flight Global and OAG, and also the opportunity to review and clean up our MCT data will transpire through the process of implementation. So what are the key changes? So geographical suppression, you could also say these are global suppressions. Um, what this means is that if you do not have an interline agreement with a carrier, what you're going to be able to do is create a, let's just call it a global suppression. And what that means is in every, you won't have to file an MCT suppression in every single station where you do not want to build connections. Uh, so for example, um, let's just say American and I'm trying to think of somebody, um, 9B Deutsche Bahn. Uh, let's say that we do not have an interline connection. So what American can do is file a global suppression of AA to 9B and then 9B to AA. And what that's going to do is in every single station where AA and 9B um, travel, connections will not build there. But I don't have to go into Heathrow, for example, and file several MCT suppressions. I can just do it at the global level. So that is going to reduce the number of MCTs that we have to manage. There are actually new data fields to support code share. Again, this is also going to reduce the number of MCTs that we file and also make sure that our code share MCTs are matching our operating and that um, everybody's in sync together. There's also a new hierarchy, and we say new, but it's really just a standard because there hasn't been one. Um, also, there's going to be a standard transmission for delivering the files to the GDSs and system providers. And there was also a standard submission format for the airlines to submit their MCTs to the data aggregators. So now we can talk about geographical suppressions again. Um, and this is just kind of a review of what I've already talked about. Currently as an airline, we have to go into every single station and file suppressions for carriers that we do not want to build connections with. What the new standard is gonna do, it will enable us to file, we can file by state, by country, by region, or you don't even have to use those fields. And I'll just use the AA9B example again. I We can just file AA to 9B. We don't have to use state, country, or region. 
Um, and then when matching flights, how it works from the processing side, when matching flights to determine if they build or not, if there's no MCT exception found, then the global suppression would hold, which means the connection would not build, which is what the airlines want. This is a big change. Um, are there any questions about this so far? Okay. Here's just an example of one. So the top two lines, um, AA and VY, Voiling, do not typically interline. So you can see how the arrival carrier and the departure carrier are filled in. There's no station over to the left. And then the suppression indicator has a Y. That means globally, all over the world, in every station, these do not build connections for AA and Voiling. However, in Barcelona and Rome, um, AA and Voiling do have an agreement. So in order to override that global suppression, the top two lines, we would file the bottom two lines. So in Barcelona, for example, we want two hours between AA and Voiling. So you fill in your stations, your connection status, the time that you want, and then the suppression indicator becomes a no. So in Barcelona, AA and Voiling would build connections at two hours. Here's another example, and why does it say under review? So you're going to see a few slides here that say under review. Um, I mentioned prototype testing a little bit ago. Several of us have been doing some prototype testing with the new um, fields and the new hierarchy. And we came across some issues, which is good because that's what the prototype testing is for. And so currently we are evaluating the carrier suppression indicator. Um, we are actually going to be recommending as a working group that that is removed. So I'm not really going to talk about that field today because I believe it's just coming out altogether. And the other big change that we have is for code share processing. Um, as an airline, we can now file MCTs for code share without specifying a flight range. So these are the new data fields that we've incorporated to um, work with the code share. You have the departure carrier, departure code share indicator, departure code share operating carrier, and then the same on the arrival side. And we'll show you what those uh, mean here. And we'll talk about those. So currently, as we all know, there is no ability to file an MCT when we are code sharing on someone else. The only way to do that is by flight numbers. And that makes the utilization of our flight numbers very inefficient because we always have to save a certain amount for our partners that we're marketing on. Um, here's just an example. Um, QF is, Qantas is the marketing carrier. JQ, um, Jetstar, I think, is uh, the operating carrier. So Qantas, with their flight ranges of 4930 to 4999, <clears throat> excuse me, is actually a Qantas flight, uh, Qantas marketed flight operated by Jetstar. That's what we have to do currently as airlines.
So now we have three ways that we can file for code share going forward. We can continue to use the flight ranges as illustrated in the top example. Um, we can also do the middle example, which is only using the code share indicator. So you'll see the carrier is Qantas, code share indicator is Y, which means that any marketed Qantas flight connecting to any other Qantas marketed flight in Auckland is going to build at one hour and 30 minutes. So that means um, anybody, anybody that Qantas markets on is going to um, get that one hour and 30 minutes. And then we also have the, the other way, which is very important to the airlines, is we can just do the operating carrier with a code share indicator. So maybe you want all of your code share flights to build at two hours somewhere, but with one specific carrier, maybe you want it less. So in the bottom example in Auckland, if we look at that example, it says, my Qantas marketed flights operated by Jetstar connecting to Qantas marketed flights operated by Jetstar is going to be an hour and 30. This is a big change. Um, there's probably going to be questions on this. We can either take them now or take them at the end. Um, doesn't matter to me. The, the other thing here too that's key of the, what this enables us to do is if you don't want to file all of your code share MCTs and you just want to default to the operating, you have that ability to do so. So you can, if you're a large airline or even a smaller airline and you have a lot of code share MCTs, but those, but you're building at the same time that the operating flights do, you can get rid of your code share MCTs altogether if you choose to. And we can show some examples of that as well or talk about those. Are there any questions on this right now? So far, no questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll talk about a little bit about the processing that I referenced a couple minutes ago for code shares. So we have, as a GDS processing system, even if you're an airline with internal processing systems, Code share going forward will be determined by the presence of a DEI 50 on the schedule. The DEI 50 on your flight schedule refers to the operating carrier. So processing is going to look for the DEI 50 on each flight leg and then um, go look. So if there's a DEI 50, it will look to match with a code share MCT where Y is specified in the code share indicator field. So what this is basically saying is that a marketing MCT exception will take priority over an operating, but if there's not a marketing MCT, if you're an airline that chooses to default to the operating, then the operating MCT is what would be used to build a marketing connection. But we have a question here. Okay, let um, me pull that up. Somebody's yeah. asking who would maintain the updated information? Um, who would maintain the updated information? Well, what information specifically are we asking about here? Let's type the question. Can you elaborate a bit more, please, by typing? Who would maintain the updated information all airline times? I guess I don't understand the question exactly. Um, the airlines are responsible for maintaining their MCTs just as we are today. 
Okay. He said it, okay. So okay. So I, I'm gonna. I think I. I think I understand the question. So let me just add um, a little more here. Um, right now, we as airlines have to manage our code share MCTs by flight ranges. Going forward, if we choose to, we can remove those MCTs and let's say, for example, AA code share operated by BA connecting to AA operating. So it'd be AA, Y, BA connecting to AA. Um, for example, if American does not, if we just want to default to the operating, we would not file that code share MCT. We would just let the BA to AA operating MCT be used to build our code share connections with BA. Does that help? That's okay. 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 I'm going to close my little question window again. Okay. So here are some other key changes. Um, airports, we're now referring to them as stations. And the reason we chose to do that is because there are several bus stations also in our MCT files. So in order to clarify and clear up any confusion, we've just changed airports to stations. With a global suppression, hmm. I don't think that holds true anymore. We're going to skip that one at the moment. Um, currently, we have just wide body and narrow body for an aircraft type. We can. We've also added the. We've separated out wide and narrow bodies so that they can be done separately from a specific aircraft. Um, filing dates will be included in the file that comes from the aggregators. And also a submitting carrier identifier will be sent to the processing systems. Uh, Bonnie, I don't know if you want to comment on that a little bit further. Uh, I, I believe in the carrier's uh, submission files, the, the submitting carrier information won't be included. So OAG and the Fly Global will be the one um, populating the information in the file. And then that information will be included in the file we provided, say, to Sabre and, you know, OAG to Amadeus and other uh, service providers. Thank you, Bonnie. And then the the last item here is that there will be a new um, there there will be a standard MCT filing template for airlines to use when they submit their MCTs to the data aggregators. And here's an example of the data submission template. And again, this says under review, and that's mostly because if you see the, the second section, the carrier suppression indicator A slash X is going to be removed. So we will have an update to this probably within the next couple of weeks. The hierarchy. Um, under review and I can uh, comment on this a little bit further because we just um, had a call yesterday as the working group, the technical portion of the working group and we've come up with the proposed 
new proposed hierarchy. So the items in red are new to the hierarchy from what we currently have. And basically um, what we've done through, as I said, through prototype testing, we found some issues with MCT, with connections not building um, as the airlines expected them to. So we had to do a little bit of change to the hierarchy to make sure that connections were building like they we expected. So the only thing that's really changing here is that flight ranges are going to drop a little bit in the hierarchy. Other than that, most of this is still the same. Uh, again, we'll have an update within the next couple weeks for everyone. Any questions on the new fields? Okay. Here's an example of the change. Um, right now, with our current hierarchy that we have right now, MCT number one would apply here because there's a terminal on it. Um, even though MCT2 has both a flight, both departure and arrival flight ranges, because there's a terminal in MCT1 right now, that takes priority. However, in the new hierarchy, so come October of 2019, October 30th, I think, um, the, the second line would apply because flight ranges will be higher in the hierarchy than a terminal. This is just one example of how the standard will change. Okay, so here's a summary of how the application processing will apply. Um, MCTs must be applied according to the hierarchy specified in the SIM chapter. Um, an MCT with a code share indicator of Y, which means it's a code share MCT, that's going to take precedence over an MCT without it. What that's saying is a marketing MCT is going to take priority over an operating MCT. When flight ranges are used, if there is a subset flight range, then a subset will take priority over the larger flight range. So for example, maybe you have flights one through a hundred with an MCT of an hour, um, maybe for an expanded period, for a short period of time, three months or whatever, you need one specific flight number to have a longer MCT. You would file, so if you have one through 100 as your flight range that's filed, maybe flight 50 needs to have a longer minimum connect time, you would file flight 50 to 50, so it's a flight range of one, you would have that with the hour and 15 minute minimum connect time. And for flight 50, that would uh, build to whatever else at an hour and 15 minutes instead of the one hour. Um, an MCT exception will override one of the global suppressions. So in the example, if you remember the AA and VY that had a global suppression, but in Barcelona, we allow connections. So that Barcelona MCT is going to override the global suppression. And then global suppressions take priority over airport standards or um, default um, global MCTs. Are there any questions on this so far? Okay, I think we can continue, Izzy. Thank you. 
As an airline, what do you need to know and what do you need to do? Um, if you choose to do nothing, um, we as a working group made sure that you can just, uh, your connections will build, should build the same going forward as they do now. The data aggregators will map your current MCT data to the new format. Uh, we do ask that once that happens that you do at least review that new MCT data to make sure that everything still is going to look the same. Um, ideally you participate in the new format and you between now and i believe the mct data freeze starts sometime in september of 2019 i don't have it officially in front of me but we're getting i, I think it's in september between now and then you would clean up your mcts so what does that mean that means if you choose to get rid of your code share MCTs, you could start that process and um, work with your partners to get that done. Um, we would file, as airlines, we will file changes in the current format up until the data freeze. Oh, look at that. Data freeze starts on the 6th of October. So the data of MCT data freeze is going to be for almost an entire month. So any and all changes would need to be in before that. And then our industry cutover date to the new format is 27th of October, 2019. We do know that this is an aggressive timeline. Um, and we, those of us in the prototype, we do believe that we can get there. So we're not asking, um, we don't believe we're asking um, too much. Uh, we know that it is a new standard. We, we do believe we can get there. Um, what will happen if you're not ready? Um, your connections may or may not build as you want them to in the new format. Um, you also won't be able to process the new MCT data because it will be in a new format. So if you consume the file from OAG, Flight Global, or any other distribution, um, you're not going to be able to consume that file because it will have the new data fields and it will be in the new format. Um, and again, the other big concern is that you may not build proper connections. Um, Bonnie or Thomas, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. No, thank you. No, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Bonnie, could you, would you mind talking about this piece, please? Uh, yes. So, um, next year um, in January, uh, the data aggregators will uh, start mapping uh, the current MCT data into the new format for airlines. And so, if you look at the first example, currently um, the MCT record looks like this at uh, Auckland, 90 minutes, D to D, QS to QS and with uh, fly ranges on both sides. So in the new world, because now we introduced a um, co-share indicator Y, so this line will become four lines because we will add, uh, data aggregators do not know for sure um, if your fly range numbers is for your marketing flights or for your operating flights. So what we will do is add a co-share indicator to um, your MCT. So if you see the um, lower left-hand side, the examples, the first line stays the same as the current MCT. And then on the second line, we'll add co-share indicator Y on the both arrival and departure side. And then the third line will add a Y to the arrival side. And then the fourth line, we'll add a Y to the departure side. And when we do this, 
will we'll make sure that whether you're um, 49, 30 to 49, 99 range is an operating flight or marketing flight, uh, the an hour 30 MCT will be applied. And um, so as Ruth mentioned earlier, the uh, first example on the top of the page can also be filed as QF co-share flight operated by JQ and then QF co-share operated by JQ. So you no longer need to update your flight range numbers because now you're using uh, your co-share partner's code JQ instead of the flight numbers. So, you know, when the flight number changed, there's no need to file a change to change your flight range numbers in your MPTs. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so as an airline, if you, maybe you're a small airline and you only have 100 MCTs, your 100, if you choose not to do anything, your 100 is going to go to 400. So, um, it's actually in our best interest as airlines to use this opportunity to go through our MCTs and ensure that we're getting rid of maybe things that we don't need. We can get rid of our flight ranges, possibly. We can uh, get rid of our code share MCTs, possibly. So as opposed to going from 100 to 400, maybe you can take that 100 and reduce it to 50. Just an example, it may not be that much that you can reduce it, but I would rather be maintaining 100 MCTs than 400. And yes, um, so as Ruth mentioned in January next year, uh, after we converted um, the MCT data for airlines, we'll be uh, sending that information to each airline and asking you to uh, review them. So uh, if you see some of the MCTs no longer applied. Uh, uh, we would like to um, get the updates from you, and so we can, you know, make sure that um, your MCT after conversion is clean and accurate. And Bonnie, correct me if I'm wrong, but the airlines have until the data freeze to do that. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so. Once you receive your uh, MCTs from the data aggregators, you actually have up until October 6th, I think, to get those cleaned up. So you'll have a good nine months, maybe a little bit longer to work through those and get those cleaned up. We we do have one question. Jojo, if you may, I can, because I can't see the whole uh, question on my screen. Can you? Of course. How airlines yeah. will report it through portal or just sending the file to IATA? Also, as this is always process, which touching two participants, who decides which carrier has to report? Ah, that's a good question. So currently, um, receiving carrier, has to concur to all filings, which that will not change um, in the new world. The receiving carrier has to concur to any filing. So it's really up to the airlines, to you and your partners to work through that process of who wants to report. Um, I believe um, this is still to be determined. I believe the aggregators may be giving a certain time period where if we're going through the process of cleaning up, that we do not have to have that concurrence, but that is not firm yet. That is still to be determined. The data aggregators are talking about that amongst themselves. Does that help answer the question? Bonnie, anything to add as well from the data aggregator side? No, um, no, I don't have anything to add. Thank okay. you, Zeke. Oh, I, I missed one part of your question, Vladimir. Sorry. Um, we will be cleaning up our MCTs and sending those back to the data aggregators, not to IATA. Correct. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Oh, to all or just to one? Um, I, that is also still to be determined. Um, I believe the data aggregators are working on something to where we would just submit to one place and it would go to all. Um, I believe that is still be deter to be determined. Bonnie, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes. Um uh, from our last discussion, uh, it was um, agreed that um, uh, we will um, coordinate with OAG on the uh, concurrent process, which means, uh, like right now, the airlines have to send their concurrence or their MCT filing to both Fly Global and OAG, and a lot of the airlines send them separately. So uh, going forward, we will have we'll ask airlines uh, cooperation and start sending their filings and changes uh, to OAG and Fly Global in, on the same email. So, um, for example, uh, right now um, Europe is in the afternoon and uh, OAG gets a filing from a European carrier and which re requires concurrence. Uh, when OAG gets that filing and um, it was before um, say, uh, U.S. Um, uh, working time. So we're not in the office yet. So OAD will take over that filing and then send to the uh, carrier for concurrence. On that email, they will copy Fly Global. So Fly Global know, like when we start our day, that that email has been taken care of. We do not need to send the same concurrence request to the same airline. So as an airline, you won't receive the same concurrence request twice, once from OAG, once from Flight Global. And so for that airline who received the concurrence request, if they uh, agree to the filing, when they respond back, they will respond to both OAG and Flight Global on the same email, say whether they concur or deny. Then um, with uh, both folks, uh, Fly Global and OAG will get the same information and update our database at the same time. So that kind of helps um, both uh, data aggregators stay in sync. So um, I hope that's clear. And uh, anybody have any questions? Thank you, Bonnie. I, that's going to help out um, everyone tremendously. Um, especially with having the aggregators on two different continents and multiple time zones. So that's going to be great. Thank you. Okay, we'll talk about um, suppressions here briefly. Um, currently, we have 999 as an MCT suppression. Um, going forward, if you look at the bottom right hand of the screen, the 999 will no longer exist. Uh, there will be a Y in the suppression indicator field. Are there any questions about suppressions right now? We've talked about this a little bit, the mapped MCT data, your one record becomes four because the aggregators do not know if our flight ranges are operating or code share. So they have to take one record and make sure that it also applies to code share. Um, so one record becomes four. So again, if you currently have 100 records, you'll end up with 400 when you get the file from the aggregators. So you can choose to do nothing with that if you want, or you can go ahead and clean those up and minimize the amount of records that you have in the new world.
And the, the data aggregators will be available for help all throughout the cleanup process. They will be your resource. So here's our timetable for industry adoption. Um, we do know that it is aggressive right now. We are not anticipating any issues with this timeline. Those of us who are in the prototype testing, we feel comfortable that we will make it there. Um, where are we right now? The, as of, so the first data sample, which has three stations in it, Paris, Heathrow, and Frankfurt, I think. Um, yes. That file is available for testing. Um, however, as of yesterday, that is going to change a little bit. So if you have that file right now, um, we ask that you just just hang on to it, but you will be, there will be a new file available within the next couple weeks. Um, it isn't changing a whole lot. It will still be just the three stations, but because of the hierarchy change and removing one of the items in the hierarchy, the data set will change just a little bit. Um, we have on here September of 2018 that OAG would provide the full MCT file for testing. That um, is probably going to be at the earliest, the end of September. That may get pushed to October. Again, we'll have more updates in within the next few weeks. Um, in January, the end of January, so we can call it February at this point, end-to-end -end testing begins up until October 6th of 2019. The new MCT data, um, once it's mapped by the aggregators, will be going out to the airlines. And again, you have until October 6th to work on those records and get them cleaned up. You can also participate in the end-to-end -end testing. Um, there will be more details on end-to-end -end testing as we get closer. Um, the 24th of March uh, is the first um, compliance testing results that will come out by IATA. I don't, Izzy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that right now. Not at this point, no. Okay. We'll provide, um, <clears throat> sorry, definitely we'll provide more details on the end-to-end -end testing and the compliance testings as we get closer to those dates. Um, the important things uh, out of this timeline are obviously the cutover date, which is 27th of October, the end of the or the start of the winter IATA season. Um, the data freeze, which starts on October 6th, and that will go through November 3rd. What does that mean? It means no MCT records will be. Um, the MCT file will not change between that time period. So any MCT submissions that you might file will be held until November for processing. Um, and then what else on here? The aggregators will start uh, sending out new MCT data probably somewhere in February. And the final day of MCT distribution in the current format is October 26th. That will be the last time that you will receive a MCT file in the current format. After that, it will be in the new format. So again, if you're not ready to consume that file, you would not be able to process connections properly going forward. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, and finally, we have the uh, where the chapter eight is uh, located on the um, in the SIM standards. Oh, we don't have, okay, I'm told that you're not seeing my okay. screen, yes? Okay. <laughs> and finally, um, thank you, Ruth. Finally, we have uh, the site here where uh, all the MCT updates uh, from all documentation updates, notices that we will be providing everyone is, loaded, is located on the CISC site. And we have a specific tab called MCT implementation 
where um, you go follow this tab and that's where all the documentation will be found and updates uh, as well from the working group and notices from IATA. Any questions moving forward, please uh, send to simarayata.org. And in fact, we have received some questions uh, during registration, which I'd like to uh, proceed with. But before I do so, any questions um, from the floor at the moment? Okay, so I'll begin with the first question that we received from uh, Sichuan Air is, how can I confirm all the MCTs of an airline? Ruth, are you happy to answer that question? Um, I'll take a I'll take a stab at it. I think the question is how do I know what other airlines are filing for MCTs? Does that sound right? That's what I yeah. Um, right now, unless you are consuming the full MCT file for your own processing, I'm not sure that there is a way. Um, however, with that being said. Um, when the full MCT file comes out for from the aggregators for end-to-end right. -end testing, you will be able to go through that and look at them there. I would think that's the best way from when uh, they receive them from, from the data aggregators. Yeah, because the other way would be very, very manual to have to go through whatever um, pro, uh, system you have, reservation system, you'd have to go through manually and look them all up. It'd be very time consuming. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, the question, there's a few questions from LL. Um, are the current MCTs displayed going to be changed in Sabre and or Amadeus? So, of course, this is a yes. Yes. Um, a technical working group. So mm -hmm. they will be um, obviously complying with the new standard. So, yes, new MCTs will be changed across every GDS system. Second question is who will transfer the current MCT exceptions to the new MCT template and when will it happen? So I think I believe this was answered in this uh, webinar that we can respond to. Yeah, so two parts to that question, I think. The, yes. the MCT template for filing MCT exceptions, that will be used um, starting in the new world. Um, as far as the mapping of the MCTs, that, that's not going to have to be done by the airlines. The aggregators will be doing that and they will be mapping to the um, just to a normal like Excel spreadsheet, it will be in the new format, but it will not be on a template per se. I think I answered that question. I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think you did, Rose. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, third uh, question is: Please explain the testing process. What am I expected to do? How will the testing be performed? On which platform? Um, I can answer some of that initially. We don't have a full test plan per se yet for end-to-end -end testing. Um, there will be a test plan. The airlines that are involved in the uh, working group will be putting together test cases on a test plan. Um, as far as I think what you oh sorry 
I heard some background. I thought somebody was going to jump in. Um, so I can tell you what some of us are doing right now. You know, we've got, we're programming this, the new logic for the hierarchy and we're doing some of our own testing amongst ourselves. So American has been testing with Lufthansa systems and um, who else? Uh, travel port and ITA. Um, it's really up to you within your organization how you want to test. Um, if your products are sold everywhere, you may want to test across all platforms. You may only want to test with your current provider. It's really up to you as your own organization. There will be a test plan available um, as we go forward if you want to use that. If you want to create your own test cases, um, again, there will be more further details as we get closer to end-to-end -end testing. Hope that helps. Yes. Okay, and finally, am I going to have a supporter throughout the testing period? There will be all kinds of support um, for cleaning up your MCTs. The data aggregators will be your support system for testing amongst platforms within your organization or any of that. Um, that is to, to be determined on who the central points of contact will be at the IATA level. We'll work on that and make sure that we have that available to all testing participants. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Then we also have a question from uh, Fly Ask Why is what are the requirements of the new MCT standards for airlines and their PMS providers? So I believe we can ask, uh, we can um, answer this well through the uh, chapter eight, if they, they, they review the chapter eight uh, requirements for the format and the procedures. Sorry, what's PMS mean? Bernard. I believe it's their uh, PMS providers is the project manager. Is that like maybe the test, uh, the reservations GDS system, processing system? Mm. I think regardless of who it is, all of that will be defined within uh, the SIM Chapter 8. There, oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention that we didn't mention on this call yet, there will be a technical guide for the development teams, and there will also be a MCT coordinator user guide that will be available for um, reference as well and to help through this process. Okay, and finally we have from uh, Jemen Air is as an air company, how to cut over from current MCT to MCT new standards smoothly without affecting the business. Any suggestions uh, from uh, from you, Ruth, from airline to airline? Uh -huh. Smoothly without impact to the business. Well, um, the goal is to make it as smooth as possible. Um, obviously, with any development project, there is some risk involved, and we as airlines have to mitigate that risk as much as we can. Um, my recommendation for a smooth, as smooth as transition as possible would be to, when you get your MCTs from the data aggregators, um, please, I would recommend going through those, cleaning up whatever you can, especially where flight ranges are concerned, because um, that is going to mitigate as much risk as possible in connections not building like you want them to. Um, from the development side, 
risk, um, again, you know, it's, it's really up to each individual organization to come up with a plan in how they're going to mitigate as much risk as possible. Um, from the business side, though, my, my recommendation is that you clean up your MCTs, work with your partners to ensure that they're cleaning up theirs as well and that you guys are aligned on MCTs. That's really going to help mitigate as much risk as possible for the business. Thank you, Ruth. I hope this is, uh, we'll, we'll go back to these um, airlines as well to, to confirm uh, the responses. And finally, I'd like to um, know whether, if, if this is your first time and you're not part of the, uh, the industry uh, working group, um, what are your initial thoughts going forward? Or do we have any comments from from anyone in terms of the, the, the capacity or impacts or, or 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 what you foresee for your your company moving forward. Okay. Isabel? Yes? Maybe it's also interesting to know if the airline joined the call have own application and airline systems they have to adapt or if all of them are only using these data on system with provider like GDSs or big reservation systems. Okay, so you're you're asking the airlines on on the on the call today uh, whether they're using the their own or big uh, big big uh, GDS systems. Is this, was this your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just to expand on what Thomas um, is asking, I guess the the big question is, as an airline, are you consuming? a full MCT data file for your own internal systems and processing, or are you just uh, using everything from um, another provider? Okay, we can uh, collate uh, those uh, questions following the uh, webinar. Are there any questions, other uh, concerns or uh, remarks or questions at this time before we close the, the this webcast? Is okay. It, I, Izzy, I just want to make one um, final comment. Yeah. I guess. Um, as I said yesterday, or as I earlier in the call, um, yesterday the technical portion of the working group got together and we are making some changes to the hierarchy. I'll say proposed changes right now because it has to go through the mail-in vote and then also PSC. We do not anticipate any issues with that. So. However, so there will be a new um, proposed chapter eight, a new MCT data set for testing. 
uh, within the next few weeks. So if you have received any of that information currently, hang on to it. Just know that there will be some revisions coming out within the next few weeks. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to take this time to thank uh, Ruth and Thomas and uh, Bonnie on uh, this call and uh, everyone uh, here that's uh, attended. I hope this has been useful and uh, has helped uh, you understand a little bit more of uh, what we are trying to achieve uh, in an industry level. And uh, please, as we've mentioned uh, throughout the whole webcast, uh, questions are always and more than welcomed. Uh, and concerns uh, regarding, regarding this uh, project for this year and next year. And we will certainly keep you uh, posted through our CISC page uh, throughout the whole process. So uh, the support is, is enormous and everyone is uh, engaged uh, with the support of uh, our working group uh, stakeholders. So uh, no one will be alone in this, and we will uh, try to ensure that uh, uh, everyone is uh, well uh, taken care of during this uh, whole uh, transition. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.